All right, so we're going to continue the chapter. Before we begin today, I was asked a very good question last week after the class, and it required me actually to do some significant thinking into this question because the question is a very important question, and it requires just the time to sit and sort of let things percolate in your head. What was the question? It was, you know, we talked in this chapter tremendously about the importance and the um, the need for the foundation of awe, of fear. And we spoke in such a strong way, I'm gonna go over some of that today. And the question is, we see, it seems always that in the Chabad teachings, in the Hasidic teachings, and in general, love and joy seem to be the primary, the more, the more talked about, the more valued uh, approach to Judaism. We don't like doing Judaism out of fear or awe or or you know, falling apart or, or, or not feeling anything. You want to you wanna have joy and love and, and, and passion in your service of Hashem. And the awe seems to be counterintuitive, which is partially what the question was. And the second part of the question was, how do we get there? How do we sort of practically apply it into our davening? Are we always, the davening should be filled with joy. Where do you get the awe? So I want to take a step back of this whole thing, of the whole idea of uh, this relationship with Hashem and the idea of awe. First of all, just a reminder, we mentioned that there are different types of awe that a person has or fear to Hashem. The most basic and the most simple and the least valued quality is fear of punishment, which means I'm afraid, and in fear of punishment, there's two levels. One is I'm afraid to do a sin because God will punish me. I'll have headaches. I'll have problems with my family. I'll have financial problems, health problems. I'm afraid to do a sin. I'll get struck by lightning, so to speak. A higher level of that is, I don't want to do a sin because I read in some books that after 120 years, and you come upstairs, the soul, if you did a sin, there's such and such a punishment. They do this to you, they do that to you, this fire is a, uh, you know, purgatory. And that's a level of fear. That's a very sad and unfortunate way to have fear of God. That means uh, my relationship is based on, I don't want to get bitten, I don't want to get hurt, and that's why I'm going to do commandments. We're not talking about that in this chapter. A higher level is fear of sin. What does fear of sin mean? I'm not afraid of the punishment. That's not my concern. I'm afraid of what sin is. Sin means a disconnect. I don't want to be disconnected. When I sin, I mean, naturally, a Jew has a relationship with God. When I do a sin, there's a disconnect. One of the metaphors we'll get to later in another section of Tanya, in a couple of years, is the uh, idea that we're connected to Hashem with 613 strands. And every time we do a sin, we cut one of those strands. We make it says as if there's a wall of steel between us and God. Now, I just want to make a, a parenthetically a comment. It doesn't mean there really is a disconnect because there never could be a disconnect with God and the Jewish people. It means from our perspective, going back to the metaphor that we use many times, um, we say about a, a teenage child who has a fight with a parent and the teenager might feel there's a wall between me and my parent. That's only in the kid's mind. In the mother's mind, there's no wall. And in the contrary, you're thinking more and more love and more feeling. Maybe there's hurt. Maybe there's pain. But wall there isn't. The wall's only one-sided. Sinning with a sin. But the bottom line is, in our relationship to Hashem, uh, a sin does make a divide, from our perspective at least. And that being said, a person's higher level or next level of fear is, I don't want to be disconnected. Not because I'm worried about being punished or I'm worried about something bad happening to me. I don't want to be disconnected from God. And that's my motivation. That's my fear. But there's a much higher level of fear, and that really falls in the category of awe. We use the word fear in English, but that's really the wrong word. Awe is called yiras habayshas or yiras harayimish. It's almost like a shame, almost, and not a shame because I'm embarrassed or something. It's a shame because the, the, the space and the relationship is like, here I am, let's say I'm a new doctor, and I meet the head of the entire hospital, when he comes into the room, I feel an awe, I feel a respect, I feel a, I, I check my words carefully and I'll be careful what I comment on and how I act, not because I'm afraid of getting fired or afraid I value this person, I recognize his greatness, and that's an awe. That's the awe we're talking about here. That's first of all. So we're not talking about here a awe or a fear which causes you to be afraid or makes you contracted in a, um, a certain um, fearful behavior. We're talking about something that puts things into the proper perspective 
And a more accurate word, though not the correct word, would be respect. Or as you say in Hebrew, I recognize my place. I know who I am. I understand who you are. And therefore, I understand my place. That's a much more advanced level of fear of Hashem. That means our relationship is like somebody who has a tremendous respect. Unfortunately, today we start to find somebody we have tremendous respect for because there's so many, uh, so little hidden today. And, uh, you know, they say the definition of a good friend is someone who knows you well and loves you anyway. They, so the truth is today we know all the great people too well to really have the proper respect for them because I see their flaws. No one's perfect, you know. But the reality is in the idea of a relationship with God, it's a tremendously uh, awesome relationship. Okay. Also, I want to remind ourselves that in chapter 26 and in chapter 31, we already spoke at length about the importance of joy. We're, we're now be, we're sandwiched between two parts of the Tanya. Number one, we're speaking about the, we spoke already in chapter 26 and 31, the tremendous value of both joy and the importance of joy. And also we spoke about the passion that one should have serving God. You shouldn't be just frozen and unfunctionable. You have to have passion and excitement and motivation, and that can only come from joy. Someone who doesn't have joy sort of clams up and closes up. So we already said that. We're going to say in about two, three chapters now, the importance of love. What we're talking here is about the foundation of Judaism. The foundation has to be awe, has to be fear. And what's amazing is, you can think to yourself, why did the Alter Rebbe wait 41 chapters to get here? If this is what it's all about, if it's all about the foundation of fear and awe of Hashem, it took us 41 chapters to get here. And the answer is, he couldn't make this point until 41 chapters. Because if you make the point, you wouldn't put it in the right perspective. Meaning, this idea that we have to have awe and fear of God as a foundation could only be properly understood if we first give you 40 chapters of explaining about what is God. Not, not really what is God, but what are we in relationship to God? What is our purpose? Why did God create us? What's our value? What's the point of working if we're never going to become perfect? What's the value? How do we stay happy in this place, in this situation where we never will be perfect? Understanding how we can fulfill meaningful purpose in life and how we can achieve joy, even when things don't go our way, even when we sin. Now, when we talk about, then we made one more point. We said, when we do our mitzvahs, while the action is the most important thing, action is like a bird. Fear and, and love is like the wings. Without the wings, it can't fly anywhere. So now, at this point, 40 chapters in, we can start talking about awe, and now understand it in the right context, in the right perspective. To appreciate this also, there's a metaphor given about uh, Sefer Torah. Every single Jew is like a letter in the Sefer Torah. So we say a letter in the Torah has two parts that make it kosher. One part is the letter, but another part is the space around it. Every single letter must have space around it. And if you don't have that space, the letter isn't kosher. If one letter touches another letter in the Torah, that entire Torah is not kosher because you have to have the space around the letter. Hasidus explains the letter represents the love. The space represents the awe. In order for the love to be the correct love, you have to have space around it, which means a letter, if you want to identify who you are and relate to Hashem, you have to understand where you start and where you finish and what you are. A letter that doesn't have space around it is not a letter. You might say, but it has all the components, but it doesn't have, as we'll see in a few moments, it has to have the right space between it and the next letter, meaning I am here and not beyond it. When you have that makaris mekleme, understand who I am, and what I am, my place, and what I am compared to God, that is when you are a kosher letter. So again, the letter itself represents the love, the space around it represents the awe, the respect, the knowing our place before God. Now let's take love for itself. The most common relationship of love is in a family. And the strongest love in general in Hasidic, we talk about two loves, the love of a brother and sister, love of husband and wife. And the most passionate, powerful love in the world, as far as passion, not as far as a uh, deep intrinsic love, is the love of husband and wife. We say that the love of a brother and a sister is much more natural, much more everlasting, much more doesn't have to be created. It's there. 
whether you know it or not, know a reason why you love your sister. It's in the blood, it's in the biology, it's in your soul. And the love of a husband and wife is not natural. As a matter of fact, the first 20 years or so of your life, 30 years, you didn't know who this person was, and it took you a time to get to know them and to get to love them. And God forbid that love could end. The love doesn't go forever. There are people whose love really ends. But in that relationship, when the love is real, it's the most powerful, passionate love. Till they could become actually one flesh. It's a, if you have a passionate love for your sister, you're, you better seek them counseling. It's, it's not a healthy. You should have a deep love, profound love. Passion is for a spouse. So, but we find something in this relationship of a husband and wife, we find a very interesting thing. When someone is looking for a match, someone's trying to find a partner in life, someone's looking for someone to marry or to be their uh, partner, the first thing you might do is think, what am I looking for? Do I want someone loud, quiet, passionate, happy, you know, serious, you know, um, a strong personality, soft personality, outgoing, quiet, you know, you look for. In other words, I'm looking for all the things that I want, that I need to in my, in my relationship, which means in a marriage relationship, if it's based on love, the first thing is what I want, what I need, what will make me happy. Why does this person make you happy? Why did you choose this person? What attracted you to this person? And the hope is, as you mature in your love, you will stop having a foundation of love and also have one of putting a self aside, which is really awe and fear. In other words, respect. That it won't be just about myself, it will be about other. One of the reasons why today in the world there's so many divorces, because people never get past that early stage of marriage. The early stage of marriage, which is rightfully so about self, about me. She or he makes me happy. I like the way he treats me. I like the way he acts. I like the way he looks. I love the way he talks. I love the way he makes me feel. So in other words, a relationship of marriage is based on love. But if it doesn't get into the eventually transmigrate into a relationship of awe and respect to, which I'll explain what that is in a moment, it will not last, or it could not last. Sometimes it lasts because you have an incredible spouse, and the spouse does everything for you regardless of your selfish nature. That's a, that's a very um, either fortunate or unfortunate reality. But a true marriage trans, uh, it migrates from just love to awe and respect. Because what really is awe and respect? Let's ask ourselves a question. What's the difference in the heart of fear and love? And the answer is love is all about me. Fear is all about other. In other words, love is founded on me, my feelings of liking you, appreciating you, valuing you, what you mean to me. I, I, I comes first, and then there's love, and then there's you. I love you. Fear is just the opposite. It's putting self aside. I am small. I am insignificant. I don't you are intimidating me. You are making me afraid, which is why we mentioned last week, when you have love, the closer you are to someone, the less you feel the love. That's the fact. When you sit now, uh, for many people who are quarantined at home, while they appreciate the time they have together, sometimes it's, uh, it's all right. Okay, maybe you want to go for a walk out of the house. Maybe let's take a break for a week. Maybe go outside because love is not as felt as when it's close because the other person's space infringes on your space. The further you are, the more you need someone, the more you love someone. If someone you love is far away, the need, I need them. Because when they're closer, their essence, their identity infringes on yours. And therefore, you don't feel the love as much. Fear is just the opposite. The closer you are, the more I'm afraid of you. If there's a something which I'm afraid of and it's far away, it doesn't concern me. When it's close, because that intimidates me. In other words, fear is the essence and the focus on other. And love is a focus on self. The most beautiful thing is when you merge the two. That's the most beautiful relationship. Now, that being said, why is it so important on the relationship with Hashem to have the foundation of fear and not the foundation of love like in a marriage? You see, in a marriage, when the two people have a lot in common, it's easy to migrate from love into fear, into respect. But with a relationship with Hashem, we never, ever will get to respect and awe of God when it starts with self. Because everything I'm understanding about God is in my image. It says God made man in God's image. When we start with love, we're creating God in man's image. I have a love. I have my perspective. I have the way I see Hashem. And now I'm applying it. It's like, you know, Lahavdil, the Greeks, 
one of the tricks the Greeks had with all their gods was why were, I mean, this is not necessarily a fact, but this is a perspective that I've heard from some wise people. Why did the Greeks have so many gods? And what was the whole Greeks infatuation with gods? All their gods were imperfect. All their gods had flaws. All their gods had the same temptations they had. And therefore, there was a very good relationship. My God also gets jealous. My God also has love and passion and, and all, the, all the feelings and imperfections. And, and in other words, they, they um, transposed, they, they um, I forget the word, they, they placed their um, view of life and of the world and created God in that image. And therefore, they, because they started from self, the only way to have a relationship with God outside of yourself, outside of your own love, is to base it on fear. What does fear mean? As we start off this chapter, God is so vast. The truth is God has no need for me. I'm not a valued part of God's existence because I don't matter. I don't exist. Yet, God shows that I do matter. Meaning the relationship is based not because I'm so special and I'm so great and I can influence or, or impact God. No, I really am a tiny, insignificant nothing. As a matter of fact, everything I have comes from God. My health, my identity, my creation, my... Everything comes from God. And that is what creates me a feeling of humility and smallness and a recognition of God. Therefore, when I have, when I have love, the more I create love, it's not based on self. It's based on the foundation of understanding how great God is. So in other words, the problem with the relationship with God is founded on love. I will never come to that place because I'll always be limiting myself to my view of how I perceive God and my relationship with God. And as I'll explain in a minute with, mountain, with the giving of the Torah, and therefore we have to have a foundation of fear. Why am I giving this long introduction? Because the ultimate point we have to know is that the fear is made to set up the parameters of the relationship. It's made to set up the understanding of the relationship, but the ultimate is to have tremendous joy. Let's take for an example, a teacher and a classroom or a boss, an employee with a uh, employer, employer with an employee. An employer with an employee, there is a difference in their jobs. One is an employee and one's an employer. If the whole relationship is based on love, it's very hard to be a proper function because the guy says, listen, uh, you tell him to do a job, they, what's the expression? They say, um, someone who does something out of fear will do exactly what you ask them and nothing more. Someone who does it out of love will never do what you ask them, but will do everything else for you. Someone who loves you will do everything else for you except what you ask them. In other words, an employee who thinks he's your partner is going to think, okay, you're having a meeting, I'm going to come sit in another meeting. You don't belong here. You have to know your place. If the employee knows his place and knows his job, then there can be a very close relationship with the employee and the employer. I know who you are. You know who I am. I am the boss. You're the employee. And we can be very close and have a good relationship because I know my place. If I don't know my place, it's a very uh, big recipe for disaster because the employee thinks he's your friend and he thinks he can do what he wants and he thinks if he doesn't want to listen to you, he doesn't have to. That's why it's so challenging when you have family and business. It's, it's almost always, unless you're very fortunate, going to end up in a fight. Why? Why does family fight so much? Because they don't know the lines between employee and employer. There's love here. What do you mean I have to do this? What do you mean I got to stay in and finish the job? What do you mean I can't take a vacation? Because I expect you to understand me as love first. The, the relationship is best when it's based on fear. And the same thing with a teacher in the classroom. The classroom where the kids think they're the friends of the teacher, the teacher can't love the students and, and express, they can't, they can't love them. They can't express his love because the kids won't behave properly. There has to be a foundation of respect in order to come to real love in certain relationships. Not in a relationship of marriage. In a relationship of marriage, the foundation could be love, but there must be respect, meaning it could start off with love, but it must include awe and respect too. Whereas a relationship with an employee, an employer, a teacher and a student, a master and a servant, or of course, a king and a subject, or God and the Jewish people must have the foundation of awe and respect. Only then could you come to true love and joy. In other words, when are you most filled with joy in serving Hashem, if the foundation is love, sorry, foundation is fear and awe, and that takes a lot of work. Why? This whole chapter is based, <coughs> excuse me, 
this whole chapter is based on a meditation. The meditation has three parts to it. Number one, <clears throat> knowing what God is, knowing who I am, and that God puts it all aside for me and wants to see what I'm going to do today. Number two, that only through a mitzvah can we have this tremendous relationship and infuse the world with godliness. And how each particular mitzvah has its unique uh, meditation and particular way it connects our chachma, our bina, our das, etc. You can't meditate on something as long as you have yourself mixed in. What does that mean? What's meditation mean? Meditation means that I'm putting self aside. Or if you're going to try and meditate and think about something while you're worried about your job, if you're going to lose your job or not, while you're worried about your health, while you're worried about someone who didn't speak to you in two weeks, while you're worried about that I didn't get what I wanted, at, you know, this. As long as you're thinking about your wants and your needs, you can meditate because you haven't cleared yourself out of the picture. Meditation means I'm taking myself, all my interests, all my desires, all my distractions, I'm putting it aside, and now I'm thinking just about the subject at hand. I'm focusing. Unfortunately, most of us have some level of distraction, and we have trouble focusing. And therefore, when it comes to meditate, we have a hard time actually completing the meditation, because 20 times during the meditation, I distracted myself with um, how come up, is it working? And the worst part of a meditation is asking yourself if it's working. I always think about the concept, if someone's telling you a joke, and I find this most frequent when someone who I'm not very close with, who I'm meeting, and they're telling me a joke, and I tell myself, I want to make sure when they get to the punchline, I'm going to laugh because it's a courtesy. I'm going to have a hard time laughing because I'm so busy thinking, am I entertained by this joke or not? You can't think about being entertained while you're being entertained. You have to put thinking aside and just be entertained. That's true in every form of relationship and especially in a meditation. So that is year. A year means putting self aside. So if you want to know another definition of awe and respect is stop being about self and making it about other. And this really is when we're the happiest in life. If you think to yourself, days in life that you went to bed at night with a good feeling, there's a good chance it wasn't because you had a good steak. It wasn't because you had a good meal or you bought yourself a new um, a thing. It might have been the first day when you bought the thing, yes. The most joyous times we're going to have in life is when we do something for somebody else. We made someone else smile. We helped someone else out. It brings us the inner joy, not the joy maybe of dancing like, we, you know, I went on a roller coaster, which most of us get headaches from. But uh, it's the joy and the true joy of something meaningful and real that makes me happy inside. It is, it is almost impossible to be happy in Judaism, truly happy, besides those flashes of the early days of any new thing. You know, the first day you put on film, the first time you light a Shabbos candle, the first time you um, go to shul, the first time you meet somebody. You know, in the beginning of relationships, it's all exciting. It's the second year, third year, 10th year, 15th year, we have to make sure you have, you have the full, full relationship. So it's very hard to have true joy in our relationship with Hashem if it's only based on how it makes me feel. When we're doing it because this is my purpose, this is the meaning of life, this is why I was created, then we truly feel joy. Joy is not just the joy of dancing or, or excitement, which is also a, a development of joy. Joy is the feeling of happiness and wholeness that we feel when we have purpose and meaning. That is what we say in chapter 26 and 27 and 28, why you should be happy even when life doesn't go exactly as you want it, and not just physical or material or, or financial. We're talking even when you do a sin, you might say, why should I be happy? Why should I be happy if I, if I got up this morning and I did something wrong? You know why? Because you're doing your purpose. Your job in life was to make the best attempt to overcome your challenges. And that is your purpose. And you've done your best. You should be happy. God gave you a challenge. You overcame it today. Yesterday you failed. Yesterday you were successful. Today you failed. You're doing your mission, your purpose. When you understand what your purpose and your meaning is, you understand your role. Now, you know, they say, if you're upset because you're not perfectly righteous, then it's all about yourself, your ego. I want to be righteous. I want to be holy. How come I do sins? Why can't I be perfect? Because you're not. You're a created being by God that has a mission and has a journey that if you understand your role, you'll come to true happiness. Your job is to struggle and to overcome today's challenges of being uh, as pious and as observant as you could be based on your journey and tomorrow based on tomorrow's journey. And each day do the best you can. The joy comes not from your success as a person, but your success in the mission that God gave you. And me, in other words, it's not about me, what I want. It's about God. And that's the idea of awe. In a marriage that starts off with love and doesn't develop eventually into a deeper 
love, which is based on respect and mutual putting self aside, both partners putting self aside and making room for other, there won't be a lasting joy in the marriage because at a certain point, you're not going to get what you wanted. It's not going to be how you wanted things to work out necessarily. And therefore you have to have self aside in a relationship with God. You can't go from love to fear. You can only go from fear to love. Whereas in a relationship with a man and another man, uh, sorry, a man and a woman in a marriage, between human beings, you could go from love to fear. It doesn't work so easily in an employee relationship. Therefore, you have to have fear first, respect first. It doesn't work that way in a, in a um, uh, teacher-student. And by the way, in a parent-child relationship, one of the reasons today why so many parents, not the only reason, but one of the reasons today why so many parents have challenges raising children is because they want their children to love them before they want them to respect them. And they're thinking that if I get them to love me, then eventually they'll come to respect me. And the, tr the truth is, if they don't respect you first, they can't express a lot properly. A child has to respect the parent first, have awe of the parent, and then you can have the proper love to your parent. Otherwise, it's a misguided love. Your parent and child relationship is not two friends, not a husband and wife. It's a child that respects and understands who the parent is, and then the love can be incredible. And then you can sit down with a child on your lap or go fishing together or go on a hike together, because the child knows he's a child and you're the parent. If he doesn't know who's the child and who's the parent, then the love is confused. What does the love mean? How do I express this love? So the foundation, even in human relationships, requires fear as a foundation, but much more so in a relationship with God. Okay, this was the idea I want to go over based on last week. Then I just want to share two very important ideas related to Shavuos and to, um, oh, actually the story with the Rebbe that took place in the 19... Uh, 50s. A very interesting story. I'm not sure how to apply it, so I'm not going to interpret the story. I'm just going to repeat it that I heard it. And the reason I won't interpret it is not because I'm so smart to say, figure it out. I'm just not sure how to interpret it, but I know it has a powerful message. The story is about this guy, I forget his name, Yaakov something, I forget his last name, who had a job, either he was a laundromat or a dry cleaner, I think it was a dry cleaner he owned in the 50s. And he was one of the Jews who came from the shtetl, and he had a very difficult time transforming and, and continuing his religious observance in the new world. Meaning, in the shtetl, he had no challenge being religious, even though it was hard, because that was what was, what seemed the way to function was to be religious and observant. Coming to America, he had a very tough time. So he came to the Rebbe and asked for advice. How could I uh, work on myself and to, to overcome my challenges in Jewish observance and, and Jewish life? So the Rebbe told them, you know, in the laundromat, in the dry cleaning business, how does it work? When you get a suit that's brand new, the suit is brand new. But when you wear the suit for a while, even if you're very careful, it can get dust on it, it can get a little faded from um, other things that get on top of the, the different moistures, and it, it can get little creases in it, and the elbows and different parts of it. And sometimes even the suit can get stains. The suit can get very full of stains, or some stains on it that are very unfortunate. How do you take care of that to, to repair it? You take it to the dry cleaners or to the laundromat. And the first thing the laundromat does is they put the clothes into a machine that has a lot of steam in it or moisture, and it's very hot. The heat then uh, and the, and the um, process is added to that mixture is a bunch of certain chemicals that have cleaning abilities. And when that's done, its truth is, it's not ready to be worn, it doesn't look brand new. What they gotta do then is hang it and take a special iron heavy press and with more heat and steam, they press it. And now the suit can actually look brand new like the day you got it. He said, a suit is like your soul. The soul comes down into this world, a newborn baby, perfect. No one has ever looked at a newborn baby and says, you got so much baggage. You got so many issues. Babies are easy to love. They have no baggage. They have no issues. They have nothing bothering them. The Rebbe once gave a talk and he said, why uh, we wish everybody to live each day like it's your first. Very different than a lot of, even in, not just in the Roman uh, philosophy or the Greek, there's also an idea in, in, in Talmud. They say, live each day like your last. Because pretend you might die tomorrow. How would you live today? Uh, you, might, uh, you might do repentance. Live each day like your last. The Rebbe says, no, live each day like it's your first. Why? He says, the number one thing that holds people back from growth or doing good things is yesterday's baggage. Yesterday's baggage means 
that this I'm not going into a shul because this guy got me angry. I'm not talking to my brother because he said something that hurt me. I'm not going there because last night in public spoke, I got all embarrassed. Everything you're doing is yes, live it like your first. Stop carrying baggage from yesterday. The beauty of a newborn baby is there's no baggage. There's no conversation where he offended you last week. There's no, he didn't upset you. There's no, if you could have a relationship with your spouse, with your parents, with your friends, with your rabbi, with your children, there's no yesterday. Everything at first, it's the easiest to love them and respect them and appreciate them. What holds us back are things that happened yesterday. My yes, live each other, because that's what the Rebbe spoke about. So a child when he's born is like a brand new suit. What happens, life goes by. I'm living in a physical body. I eat a lot of meals and I say things and I do things that are hurtful or upsetting or mistakes and we're humans. Every day we can think of things I wish I did differently. How do you clean that? How do you get past that? The first thing says the Rebbe is heat. Heat represents the warmth and the heat of Yiddishkeit. Yiddishkeit has warmth. And also the moisture, the lachluch is the joy, the feelings, the juiciness, the, the moisture, the feelings of Judaism. And then you have to have the chemicals, the components, which is like the mitzvahs, certain ingredients that you add to the mixture. You have to add certain mitzvahs, but that's not enough. You have to feel the burden of God on your shoulders. If you don't feel the press of the iron meaning, on some level, you don't feel the press, it's very, very hard to return to being a pure soul again. The way you maintain a pureness is to have the combination, the warmth of Yiddishkeit, the juice of Yiddishkeit, the um, ingredients of Yiddishkeit, which is the mitzvahs, and also the weight of the press upon you. That's the story. I'm not going to interpret it further. Okay. The last part of today I want to do is focusing on, as we go further in the chapter, one interesting Gemara and discussion which is connected to our chapter and connected to Shavuos. I started talking about this last week a little bit. I want to give a little more insight into it because Shavuos is coming up in a couple of days. And actually, on a separate note, I was learning a mimer yesterday with somebody. A mimer is a Hasidic discourse where the Rebbe explains, or any of the Rebbe's explain, a very deeper, a much deeper analysis of a mitzvah or a relationship with God, a service of God. So the Rebbe, in this particular mimer from 1969, and he bases it on a mimer of the Alter Rebbe from the late 1700s. He explains that approaching Shavuos requires two feelings, a feeling of bittel, of removing self, and a feeling of self being complete, wholeness, which seem to be two opposite things. One is the feeling of that we are nothing before God, that we're coming before God to receive the Torah. My, I don't exist, I don't matter, I'm nothing, and here is God, is everything. And the second part is, I just counted 49 days, I've appeared myself, I've fixed up my chesed, my gevur, my teferis, I'm, I'm making myself complete, and I'm making myself whole, and I'm understanding. So let's say, which one is it? And the Rebbe explains in the mind, we need both. The foundation first is putting self aside, understanding the relationship, and then having the, so to speak, the fullness of, of um, developing self in a healthy way. In other words, he gives us a direction how to get true joy in the holiday of Shavuos, is by coming complete, not becoming more self, but becoming, becoming more of what God wants you to be. In other words, they say, becoming less self doesn't mean that I don't matter, I don't exist. It means I only matter because God is my source. I matter because God wants me to matter. He created me. He made me. It's a recognition of God and your identity. Okay, that's the Mimer point. So there's a story in the, in the Talmud, which is really quoting the, uh, what happens by the giving of the Torah where Hashem is about to give the Torah, and after the Jews accept it, and about to accept the Torah, God picks up the mountain and threatens them with a the mountain on their head. And he says, if you don't accept the Torah now, I'm going to crush you and destroy you. There are a lot of, a lot of answers to, this quest, to, the, to the question, the obvious question. And Tosfos, the commentary, uh, who asks, Tosfos lived probably in the years, um, the authors of Tosfos lived probably in the 12th and 13th century. Um, they ask a question, and they say, what was God thinking? You had a beautiful relationship going on here, as you mentioned last week, about to get engaged, and then you threaten the bride with, uh, with, uh, with death if you, don't, if, you don't accept the, if you don't accept the Torah. So Tosus gives an answer, and that is, God wanted to make sure that a few moments later, when he is going to start the brimstone on fire of his revelation, which is going to be overwhelming, as we saw, the Jewish people actually passed away, and God brought them back to life with the dew that he's going to use when Mashiach comes to make resurrection of the dead, he was afraid, he was not afraid, he was concerned that the Jews would back out of his only love. It's like, <laughs> I remember somebody, um, it was a good friend of my father, who when we went to build our original building in 1996, so somebody approached this friend 
and said to the friend, um, uh, I know you're very close with the rabbi, you love him very much, this person is very wealthy, would you give X amount of money to help build this building? And he said, uh, no. So he would ask, but don't you love the rabbi? He says, sure, I love him, but not that much. You know, <laughs> I love him, but not, not a million dollars worth. In other words, God was concerned that maybe when we're going to go and show the awesomeness of God, we're going to get frightened and run away. I'm saying, no, 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 it's over. It's... God said, I'm putting the mountain over your head to tell you, don't try and run away. I know you're excited, but it's going to get challenging later. But even when it gets challenging, don't, it's, I don't want you to run away. That's what Tosman says. The um, Others say a very unusually interesting answer, and I was debating sharing this or not, but it's worth sharing because it's fascinating. There's a law in the Torah that discusses a case of a woman who is seduced by a man and has a relationship, physical intimacy, by seduction or by rape, by forced relationship. And the law is very interesting. The law is, if a woman is seduced and she has a relationship with this man, the man now, because he did this relationship, has an obligation to marry her. But if he wants, he can get divorced later. But if a man rapes a woman, and we're not talking here just in the case that we know of today, because in our minds, we can't even fathom why a woman would want this. But let's say for whatever reason, the woman who, who is raped by this man uh, decides she agrees to this plan that the man has the obligation if she wants to marry him. So the man... Let's say it was some very important dignitary or some person that she had a relationship with anyway, and he forced himself upon her. The law is that he is never allowed to divorce her without her permission. That means she becomes the boss in the marriage in the sense of relationships. He can never end the marriage. That's the law. So there's a commentary that says that the reason why God held a mountain over our head was really secretly a defense for the Jews. He said, this relationship I'm going to force upon you. And the law is when a marriage begins because he forced himself upon her, the man could never end the marriage. That means even if later in life, the woman seems to do things that he doesn't like, I'm sorry, our relationship is unending. God wanted to give, so to speak, the Jews a way to say, even if you mess up later, you can't end this marriage. That's what some commentaries explain. The Maharal of Prague says, the reason why God held a mountain over our head was he wanted to tell us a message. It will tell the world a message. I know this relationship is based by choice, but the truth is there is no other option. Our relationship is so intrinsically connected, not as a threat, not as a force, but there's no other options. Like sometimes you have a relationship of a man and a woman, and it's not like they say, you know what, I really love to get married to this person. I can't live without, there's no other option. This is the only way the world can go on. God was, that's what Maharala Prague says, that God held a mountain to show that there is no other choice. I know you guys are choosing out of love, but to the day before we said we accept, okay. the Baal Shem Tov gives a whole other insight. That's what I want to share with you right now as the message for Rosh Hashanah. The Baal Shem Tov says that God was telling us that the relationship is not about you. I know that, and I'll tell you what that means in a second. It sounds a little bit odd. Hashem is telling us it's not about you. What does it mean? God's telling you, I know that you think the relationship is based upon you and you started this relationship because you love me and you want to be related to me and connected to me, but you should know it's much, much bigger than that. Beyond any of your limitations, a human being's love is limited. A human's being abilities are limited. We have some days we're very fickle. You start a diet and tomorrow you're not interested. Some days you get very observant and tomorrow you're not interested. That's how God made us. We have some days we're very motivated and excited. I'm going on a diet and I'm starting a new way of life. And it's not just for now, it's always. You have people that get very motivated and get extremely increased in their observance. They start coming to shul every day. And then six months later, you know what? I'm not so excited. Or somebody says, you know, I'm growing a beard. I don't want the beard. We have all different levels of relationships with Hashem because we're normal and because we're human. And that's how we are. And everyone's that way. Some are more noticeable from the outside. Some are not. Some are hiding from other people their challenges, and some don't hide it. But the reality is that's the story of the Jews' life throughout history. Closer, further, read the prophets, read the books of the writings, read their history. There were communities that were so close and so far. That's how we are. We're limited to our personal struggles. And God's saying, I want you to know something. Don't worry. It's not about you. The relationship is not based upon you and your limitations. Even the days when you're not feeling it, I got you covered. I don't mean it as a pun, but I got you covered with the mountain. Though that's a good pun. I mean, I got you covered. I am taking care of the relationship. Even when you don't feel the love, it's from my side we're related. 
I have you covered. You're not feeling spiritual. You're not feeling observant. You're not even being observant. You haven't put on filling in two years. Don't worry. The relationship was never about you. It's a much deeper understanding. Not that our actions don't matter. There is love. But that's not what created and that's not what holds a relationship together. And what we're telling you is like a parent telling a child, even if you hate me, I love you. Even if you're mad at me, I love you. Even if you offend me, I love you. Because at the end of the day, I don't love you because how you act. I don't love you because what you do for me. I love you because I'm your mother. And that's what God was telling us at Sinai. The relationship is based upon something much bigger than you. And that's the whole idea of this part of the chapter. And that's why the next thing we lead into, which I'll just start the first few words today, and we're going to go to it next week, is so phenomenally connected to this point. The idea of the awe is not made to make us feel less. It's to make us feel more. Because the less it's about me, the more I am. As long as I'm living on my limitations, on my love, that's a very dangerous limitation. If my love comes after my awe to God, and I understand the relationship, and God started the relationship, God shows me, and I am just a small little Jew. But this small little Jew, what's the meditation? God is everything. The hell, your world, the lower worlds, And you are nothing. You are insignificant. Yet he puts everything aside. Do you know what matters? You little Moishi, that's what matters to me today. Are you going to say the benching or not? When we understand that, and we have that sense of, oh, that's what makes us bench, as we'll see in a minute. Even if I don't feel anything, but I pick up the bencher and I bench, I'm living the dream. Because at the end of the day, I can't always be there. And as we'll see, we don't always have the choice. We'll see in a moment that each of our souls are different. Some souls come from a very high place. Some come from not such a high place, not such a high place. And therefore, we have different struggles. And therefore, we can't compare one person's service to another. Because every person has a different story. The only thing we all have in common is we're one people under one God. And we all serve the same God in the same way that it's not about me. It's about God. But what I do matters because that's what God wants. And that is the whole really story of the giving of the Torah, the Mount Sinai. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Salma told me something so interesting. So the, the point of this chapter is, and this is the point I wanted to try, and again, I gave it some thought myself to try and articulate this idea, is to understand the awe and the fear that we're talking about here is not an awe and fear that makes you feel uncomfortable and makes you feel uh, like I'm, 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 I'm in awe of God right now. It makes you understand your place. It makes you understand the relationship. It makes you understand that it's not about self. It's not about me. It's about God. But I matter because God wants me to matter. And therefore, when I work on myself and developing myself, I'm not becoming more me. I'm becoming more what God wants me to be. And therefore, I will have not a more ego, but a more sense of appreciation in my role, maybe to work harder, maybe to try and be a better, even a better person, instead of looking back with satisfaction of, look how great I am. Because I understand my role, and it's the awe that will bring me to the true happiness, the feeling of my purpose in life is real, my purpose in life is meaningful, I have a purpose, I am living, so to speak, my purpose, and that will bring us to the true level of joy. I just want to finish for two moments what we're going to go into next, because it's a very interesting idea. And it will sound best if it comes off what I just said. Well, on page Nun Zion, um, it's the page after 112. And I'm just going to read two lines, and we'll start this again next week. So we said this last 20 lines is based on one thing. What's if I don't feel the awe in my heart, only in my mind? My mind gets it. My mind understands this relationship. My mind understands that God is so great. My mind understands that I'm so small, and yet God chooses me. Chooses me and shows me. But what's if I don't feel? He says, don't worry, because deep down you feel it. Deep down, that's your identity. That's what we said, if you remember, last week. Now we ask the second question. What's if I don't even have the ability to grasp it in my mind? What's if my mind doesn't get it? Forget about my feelings. I don't get this idea. I am not affected by it. You have people that can be in the presence of a great, great person, whether it's a great scholar, a great scientist, a great doctor, and their coarseness does not allow them to recognize the greatness. Not that, their, not that their coarseness stops them from acting right. I don't see what's so special about this guy. They go to a holy place, a person comes to the hotel, a person comes to the grave of a tzaddik, and he doesn't get it. I don't see it. They can sit there and have a sandwich or, um, or to chat with a friend about some silly idea or say it in an appropriate statement. Why? Because your coarseness does not allow you to even think where you are, what it is. So if a guy says to himself, hey, Rabbi, author of the Tanya, holy rabbi, 
I understand what you're saying, but I can't connect to that. Forget about feeling it. I don't even relate to it intellectually. Even intellectually, it doesn't speak to me. And he's going to tell you, don't worry about it. And that's what we're going to see now. He's going to say, Even if someone can't even get it in his intellectual capacities and this thought, now you don't feel it in your heart. I don't even get it in my mind what you're talking about here. I can't, I, this, I, this meditation doesn't speak to me. Forget about if I am moved by it. It doesn't speak to me. I don't feel any awe, I don't feel any shame, I don't feel any smallness. Because my soul is a little more coarse. Every soul comes from another place. Every soul, for one, that's why one of the phenomenal things are, we can see another Jew who never comes to Shul and doesn't fast on Yom Kippur. And they might do a particular mitzvah that you might say to them, come on, that mitzvah counts, look at you, you don't do this. That perspective is so un-Jewish. Why? You don't know this soul. You don't know this story. And it could be for this person to come into shul for 20 minutes in Yom Kippur, overcame a much greater hurdle, went against their understanding, against their feelings, than you going on Yom Kippur and standing and davening for 26 hours straight and not sleeping. Because that person's journey and story is different. You don't know what another person's journey is. And therefore, he's, he's, he's really saying, he's, to know that is what he's saying here. What's if I'm one of those people that doesn't even feel it? Not even in my mind. And he's going to tell you, still don't worry about it. 